Okay, sweet, let's jump in. So before we go into the actual CICD stuff, I think the best place to start with this is to talk about like what the actual problem is that we're trying to solve <clears throat> in like culture. So I think about these things as more of a, like, yeah, everything's software and we're developing software. That's all great. We're really trying to like ship products out to clients and like reliable code so we can make money and make people happy, all that stuff. But the purpose of a CICD pipeline, the purpose of this talk is more talk about like organizational culture and like how we structure teams, how we structure our business as a whole and how that applies towards our CICD pipelines. And that culture, I guess, would be like agile or DevOps. Uh, I guess DevOps would be part of agile, but uh, to go narrow, more narrow in scope, we'll talk about like DevOps culture and use that as like the theme to carry out throughout the talk. So, uh, and I have a link here. A lot of these like ideas come from that I have come from like Martin Fowler and his ideas that he has and developed with like agile methodology and DevOps culture and whatnot. And like I said, these things are, you know, they're, they're opinionated and maybe not perfect solutions for everything. And this will change over time. But for now, this is what the more successful teams are using. So with DevOps, this diagram here, I think illustrates the point of shared responsibility and that we DevOps isn't a role. It's like a, it's a, a way of thinking, a way of working together. And so with that, we want to have between our application and our teams, not a team that does just infrastructure or a team that does, does just development or does QA. Like we want to have our teams be like almost where there's no dividing line and like everybody's able to like work collectively together. Sure. Like you could have in practice an infrastructure engineer or like an infrastructure team that like is maybe the code owners of uh, more infrastructure based tooling like platform work or setting up VPCs or setting up the core infrastructure, but you still want to have your developers be a part of that uh, DevOps pipeline and be a part of actually like building infrastructure that relates to their application and whatnot, whether it's monolith or microservice, it doesn't make a difference. And so with that, we have automation. There's like five key points for um, DevOps, and this is coming from this blog, so I'm kind of like stealing a bit of ideas from there. Definitely go check it out if you want to go more in depth. But uh, automation is a big point of making, uh, like, um, I'm losing my words, uh, incorporating a DevOps mindset. So we want to make sure that everything that we're doing, we can automate in some form or fashion to where we're not going into the AWS CLI or into the AWS console and typing out commands or like clicking buttons and manually configuring things or like running tests where we're just doing smoke tests or whatever. Like we want to have automated tests running in our pipeline that we're going to talk about later on and why that's important. Shared responsibility between teams where we have, um, you know, debt, like it's not that as a developer, I write code. And then I have some DevOps engineer make sure that it's deployed. Like as an engineer, I need to make sure that my code gets to my gets to the client, gets to production. That goes into like what the definition of done is. Whenever you're working with a team in an environment where you're writing out tickets and whatnot, definition of done shouldn't be developer completes code, writes a unit test, and sends it off to whoever else is next in the pipeline to handle that. It should be the developer is responsible for getting that code in production and making sure that code works, setting up monitoring, being a part of like. Uh, an SRE environment, another thing that could be not a role, but rather a uh, um, mindset, uh, site reliability and stuff like that, making sure that your application's live and healthy and functioning well. That goes into having no silos so that people aren't separated in groups, communications open across the organization. Um, all these things kind of build off of each other. Uh, autonomous teams being that if you had you want to have trust within your team and within every team as like maybe a VP of engineering or director of engineering to allow your team to have a longer leash to be able to experiment and break things within, you know, our appropriate environments and whatnot um, to allow them to experiment and like build better practices and believe that your team has the capacity and capability of doing that. And then feedback goes into continuous delivery and deployment. Um, the idea that Martin Fowler talks about is if you want to have uh, constant feedback from your users. You don't want to write software that nobody likes or nobody's going to use. It's not useful. So the idea is that you're shipping code frequently and getting feedback from users to see is that code, you know, being used as a uh, a good use of time. And if not, getting the feedback to correct that and make it so it's something that people can use. 
So the purpose of CICD goes into all these things. Um, I guess the idea in my mind right off the bat is just we want to automate and speed up the delivery of new code and, and quality code to end users, being that we want to make sure that we're developing new features and new things so that our end customers are happy. We want to do that in a way where things aren't breaking. We want to do it as quickly as possible while maintaining quality. So the CICD pipeline will help us with that, like continuous integration, continuous deployment. Um, so continuous integration uh, is basically how we're going to constantly be running our linters, running our like tests, uh, making new tests, end-to-end -end integration, um, uh, unit tests, whatever it may be that we need to have code, uh, just making sure that we have full test coverage of our code so that things are quality and not broken. And then constantly every day, Kent Beck said that to be a part of continuous integration, you need to be committing code at least once per day. So continuous integration is taking your new code whether it's completed or not, and we'll get into this with a uh, trunk-based development and pushing that code into the development environment at least once per day. Um, and that's across the, the board for everyone and your team and making sure that you're writing unit tests and your linter is passing, whatever code quality checks that you have, um, making sure that all those are up to date constantly. So continuous delivery and deployment, um, I, I like I said, I get a lot of ideas from Martin Fowler, so bear with me. Uh, so he says that it's a software development discipline where you build software in such a way that the software can be released to production at any time. So the idea is like, and this goes into trunk-based development a lot. So a lot of these ideas go towards that. Like I said, there's a bias I have towards, and this talk will be towards like implementing that. So the idea is that we wanna have constant integration into our code base. So we're writing our tests, we're having our linter pass, everything else, our like build pipeline, we're getting our code into development and that should be constantly ready to go out into production. And I'll get into this a little bit later in more detail, but you can do that through branching by abstraction or feature flags and things like that, feature toggles and separating ways that maybe that code's not being used in production, but that code is still existing in the production code base that so you're constantly pushing out code. So that, that way, at any point, if you're, uh, CTO or CEO or whoever it may be is like, hey, we need to get this code out. We need to get it out now. It's not like a panic or anything. It's like, okay, we're confident we can do that because we have all these quality checks, all these tests. We have um, feature toggles around incomplete work. We can set up A-B testing, all the things I'll go more in detail with, but that's the gist of continuous delivery. And deployment, the biggest difference is um, Delivery is having the ability to put it into production. Deployment is constantly putting into production. So every day through our CICD pipeline, I push up code and we're doing deployments multiple times a day. So pretty similar, but a little nuanced difference between like you can choose whether to decide to deploy or not or deployment, continuous deployment is constantly deploying every day. So going into our different um, branching strategies now. So we've got three we're going to cover, the environment-based, uh, GitFlow, and then Trunk. So environment-based would be more like you had, um, for this example, a, a QA stage or main. Maybe we'd have a development environment here too. It's not shown in the diagram, but we would have a branch per environment. And so whenever I elevate to a new environment or to a new branch, and I say, I'm going to make a feature branch, merge it in a development then go from development, merge development into QA, then I'm going to be deploying to that QA environment where like maybe something different would be, I have dev and QA both on the development branch. So whenever I make a push to develop, it would deploy to both of those environments instead of it being broken up by different Git branches. Um, and this is like a key thing I'm gonna keep touching on is this uses Git specifically to elevate to different environments like merge requests, um, or merging between branches or whatever it may be, like the orchestration of elevation of code happens within uh, using Git, which is, uh, that's the big difference between this and trunk, which we'll get into. So here's a little diagram of maybe what it would look like in a CIC pipeline in AWS. So developers make code changes to whichever branch, like to, uh, for this case, it would be like a develop branch goes through the pipeline, whatever repository you want to use, Git Bitbucket, CodeCommit, or uh, GitLab, GitHub, whatever it is, 
Code Pipeline is the AWS tool that uh, listens for events within your repository to then take down those new that new code change. And then code build would, would be where the actual code's built. You're running tests, you're running linter, things like that. You're actually building the code, making artifact, storing it into S3. Then code build could actually deploy those code changes onto your um, EC2 instances. The application I built, well, my diagram is a little bit out of date. The application I built um, doesn't use code deploy, but it does use code build and cloud formation, and it uses lambdas. But the point is the separation of branches per environment. So you'd have three pipelines here to match three branches, which would be uh, dev stage prod for this example. So that's the gist of why this is separate like this. And then really quickly to touch on why these look like different accounts, they are different accounts. We have one pipeline account that handles all the different pipelines, and I'll show this in, in uh, the console later on. And that uh, has cross account access to the appropriate account of whichever one it needs to deploy to. And so it'll assume a role in AWS and then deploy it to those different accounts. So that way we can isolate our CICD pipeline in one place and make changes to that and then have our appropriate accounts uh, separate from the pipeline so that they're like single responsibility. Um, if you guys have any questions, like feel free to jump in and cut me off, but so moving forward with Git flow. Hey. Yeah, do it. Austin, do you, do you tie those together with AWS organizations? Uh, yeah. Or is yep. that just an option, right? Yeah, this, this was all configured with AWS organizations. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, so with GitFlow, like I said earlier, whenever we were talking about these different environments and how maybe you could have it set up to where dev environment or dev branch could deploy to two separate environments. It doesn't have to be branch to environment and those like match up. That doesn't, it doesn't have to exist that way. We could have multiple environments and only have two branches, which is traditionally how GitFlow works. You could incorporate more branches, um, but traditionally GitFlow is a developed branch and a main or master branch. And the differences that we would have and that I've put out in this pipeline uh, in this diagram that we have uh, further on is um, for my example, we have a dev stage and master uh, or pro production environment. And so we're gonna separate our branches to be uh, dev branch. And then maybe that's just for the development pipeline. And you could argue different ways of doing this. And then the master branch would go, we would cut a release branch, merge that into, ma into uh, the master branch that would deploy to stage. And then you could have a gate within the pipeline itself with AWS tooling. I don't know about other tools. That would be a manual approval. Then that way you could go to the next um, environment that would be master after or to production after your uh, you know, UAT or whatever acceptance test if you had any would happen in stage. It doesn't have to be that way, but the point is you don't have to separate, you don't have to have just a uh, branch per environment. So with the release branches and Git flow, instead of just merging from place to place to place, you're gonna make a branch from your develop environment and cut that branch, maybe run like, like I said, acceptance tests or whatever testing you wanna have if you're having any testing and then merge that in once it's stable to the master branch. Master branch is then gonna be responsible for releasing into production. So we've got two branches um, and we're gonna make a release branch off of develop and merge that into master to deploy to production. So we wanna make a hotfix. <clears throat> Let's say that we made our release branch and then we're doing our acceptance tests and we found a bug and there's like something that needs to be fixed before we go to production, like all standard protocol. We need to make a fix because something got through our unit testing integration test, not uncommon. So this would happen um, from the top and then trickle back down. So you would make, if you had like a bug in production, you would make a branch off of the master branch and then fix the bug, push that back into master to immediately fix it, and then take that bug and that branch and push it back down into develop. That way you don't forget to uh, 
um, you, you can't forget to do that. Otherwise you're going to have like regression errors. And next time you make a push, if that bug wasn't merged back down into develop, then you're going to have uh, the bug reintroduced back into master, which is obviously a problem because you've already fixed the bug and you pushed it back in. Um, so if you had that with uh, a release branch, then you could fix it on the release branch, push it up. Um, this is a bit different in trunk, but we'll get to that. And then after we make the release branch, we're going to tag that. So we have different versions of our um, deployments. And that's the same way across the board for all of these different um, branching strategies. So here's a quick diagram of what this would look like. So we're making future branches off of develop, merging those back into develop. Let's say we wanted to have a hot fix. Um, we can make the hot fix off of the master branch. And then we fix that um, bug. We push it back into master and into develop. That way we don't have a regression error. Uh, and then if we wanted to do a release, we're going to go from develop, make a release branch, and then push that up into uh, master, which would be deployed to production. And then up here, you can see the different um, tagging of uh, versions per release. And then for the pipeline, what this will look like is two separate pipelines. So we have the first one, similar to what we had before. You push the dev, dev deploys to the dev account, um, updating our dev environment for all of our developers. And then for production and for staging, if you wanted to have a staging environment, maybe you wanted to do more testing there, I don't know. Depending on the organization, maybe you don't, maybe you do. Um, maybe you have another environment that could be QA, maybe you could live within the dev account. It all depends, but the point is you're going to have two different pipelines that are deployed to uh, one or many different environments, depending upon your testing needs. Um, but then for here, this is going to be gated for a product deployment by manual approval step. And that's within the code, the code suite that AWS has. Um, this could be set up in different ways, but for the architecture to look at it and like something that's tangible, this is how I have it set up for now. And I'll show this in the console so you can like get a visual of what that looks like. So moving on to the, to the fun stuff. So trunk-based deployment or development, quite a bit different. So before what we had was, um, let's see, uh, we use Git to elevate to different environments. I think I have that somewhere within here too. Uh, yeah, use Git to elevate to different environments. We really want to outline that we're using Git to merge to different branches to deploy to different environments. A branch does not need to equate to an environment. That's the old way of doing development. Um, but that's how a lot of people still have their branching strategies. What it could be instead, uh, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, is you gated by feature branches, which are basically if state or feature toggles, which are more or less if statements. And I'll show a code example. Um, backtracking a little bit, trunk-based development is where you have one single branch and that single branch is used by all developers and you could go where you immediately commit to trunk or you could make feature branches, but the point is you have one mainline branch and these like branches or trunks, or whatever, the terminology comes from like thinking about a tree, the trunk is the whole, is the biggest branch of the tree. That's like the main part of the tree and you have branches that would come off of that tree. But with trunk, we don't need other branches other than maybe a feature branch if that's the way you want to have your team work together and go through PR approvals and whatnot. Um, but with trunk, we're going to deploy to every environment. So we could still have a dev stage and prod environment, but just have one branch. And all of that would be set up within uh, our code and within our pipeline. Um, and it also allows you to incorporate continuous delivery and continuous integration a little bit easier. And I'll go into why in a second. So uh, feature changes are not elevated by Git. That's like the key difference between trunk and any other branching strategy is your feature changes are elevated by more or less pretty if statements, uh, which are called feature flags or feature toggles and branching by abstraction, which is still with feature flags, but in a, uh, little bit more specific sense. So the different types of develop, development that you could do within Trunk, you could have smaller teams, maybe work where they don't create feature branches off a of Trunk. They'll go directly on Trunk itself or whatever branch you want to call it. It could be called main or master, and they could 
pull down the latest of whatever uh, that branch has um, and then develop directly on that and then push directly up. Now to do this, the teams uh, should be smaller. I think the trunk based development uh, website says like one to a thousand, which is such a crazy range of people. Um, I don't know how you are one to a hundred or something like that. Um, I don't know how that would work with that many people, but you'd have to have really good gates set up with test coverage, automated uh, test coverage set up. Maybe you'd have, if you're using Node.js, there's a NPM package called Husky that would run git commit hooks. So that way, before you even pushed up code at all, you would have a full test suite run, you'd have a linter run, you'd have end-to-end -end test, maybe some uh, Selenium stuff, acceptance test, um, just a ton of tests that would run so you don't break the build. And if you did break the build, instead of, um, doing a fix or re it, uh, reverting back, fixing it and pushing forward, you would fix forward. So in, if you had a broken build or a broken thing that went into production, instead of uh, reverting that change, developers should be quick to go back and fix that change and then roll that bug fix forward, not rolling back, not reverting. Um, and this makes for like more, this makes for quicker release processes because we're not going through different uh, PR approvals or like different stages of deployment. We're adding good test coverage, ideally your pair programming. Um, and this way you can like ensure that you're not breaking things as much. And like I said, if you do, then you're fixing forward. Um, going forward with the next type, scale trunk based development, which is what I would probably integrate if I were working with trunk. Uh, this is where you can create feature branches. Um, so instead of just having a Durham line or a test suite, which would take a lot of setup and time to build something that would be reliable enough, which is, you know, an issue I, I see often is there's a lot of push from companies like the actual company and organization itself, you know, they need to make money and build new features and whatnot. Maybe they have pressure from clients or pressure from parent companies, whatever it may be to get new features out the door because everybody's trying to make more money and make more money every year and whole another conversation about that. Um, but with, uh, I feel like I, I lost my train of thought, I almost went on a rant. Um, uh, shit. So with uh, scaled trunk development, we're gonna make um, uh, code reviews a thing. So this way we can like actually review each other's code, which would be, if you could think about it, it's like asynchronous pair programming in a way. Uh, so maybe like with our uh, virtual situation with COVID and everybody being remote, and not working in an office, you know, five days a week with each other, or not having a good way of setting up pair programming um, uh, virtually, then we'll do pull requests, and that way we can have asynchronous pair programming. Um, and then, like I said before, everybody needs to run their tests locally and whatnot. This could still be done with a git commit hook. That way, you can never forget. It'll run automatically. If it fails, then it, your code will not get pushed up until that build passes. Um, yeah, all feature branches go up the trunk. Um, I think that's the gist of what I had. I know I was saying something else and I lost my train of thought, so bear with me. I don't know what I was saying before. So the last version is coupled patch review system. This is how Google writes their code. So they have a mono repo and they do trunk-based development. It's crazy how they set this up, I guess, with the amount of time that Google has to focus on their actual development, they're able to produce good uh, development practices like this. And patch review is way beyond the point of this talk. And that's why I don't have many bullet points on it because I don't fully understand it. Um, so I'm not gonna like bullshit away of like what it is, but essentially instead of making pull requests and whatnot, all of these tests would run on commit, similar to how it works with the uh, smaller team uh, development where you would not have feature branches, but they have a bunch of patch review systems that I don't understand like Fabricator, Garrett, um, and that would run and run the set of like tests and whatnot on your commits and then push that back and make sure to gate production or whatnot. Cause they have developers on like 4,000 team or 4,000 person developers on a mono repo. So they need to make sure that they're not pushing in changes with that many people pushing up code and uh, also need to maintain velocity. So here's a pretty big diagram that illustrates the different flows. 
Um, so this would be if we're doing like smaller team or if we're going with feature branches or if we're going the patch review system. So it all starts off about the same. Um, you'd want to pull the latest from whatever branch, trunk, master, main, whatever it's called. Uh, um, trunk based development says that you should typically be doing per program if you can. Then if, if not, then you could put up a pull request or whatever and have people review it async. Um, and then let's say that we're going to push a commit directly to master and we're not going to have um, uh, a pull request. Then we would go through this process. Uh, CI runs, it passes. Then code basically gets deployed. Nothing too crazy there. Um, same thing with this one. If we're going to have uh, short-lived feature branches, then we're going to have a pull request. Some people are going to review it. Maybe they send them back comments, say you need to fix this or that. We're going to have still the same integration, um, test suite run, blender run, code quality checks, whatever it may be. Then we're going to push our branch in, deleting the branch. And then the same thing with uh, patch review. Um, this is based off of different commits, letting everything run and then push it in. So things aren't that much different. Like I said, I would probably go with scaled trunk so that you could have pull requests and everybody work together, especially being all virtual and whatnot, if you're not able to pair program, but that's just me. So if you want to release back to the feature toggles, we're not releasing based off of Git changes or Git commits other than like merging in, but for those changes that maybe are incomplete, like let's say you're writing a new feature. Like I had to do something at a previous company where we had to rewrite the way we did authentication. We're using Cognito and we wanted to have something that was cheaper. So we built an in-house solution and we weren't ready to migrate completely to the in-house solution yet. So maybe we would have a subset of users use the in-house solution and a subset of users use the uh, Cognito solution still, the, the legacy way of, our, our, of us doing our authentication. And how we did that was glorified if statements well for for my example it was just if statements to say like if boolean you know if this is enabled then uh let's use trunk or sorry let's use cognito otherwise let's use the um uh, native auth or if this is this user from this company or whatever then use the native auth or use cognito or whatever it may be so this way we can like change how, which users which use different flows but we can also say we're not ready to release this yet. We wanted the code to be done so we could still release the code and push that out into production and have the code there so like the feature is done. And then whenever we're ready to migrate users over, all we have to do is switch the configuration value to be like, hey, switch this from false to true, being that now use the new uh, feature that we have built. Or if we don't have a feature completed yet, like here's my little example of some code with uh, a feature toggle. Like let's say, uh, we started writing this and just use your imagination. I know this doesn't exist here, but let's say like you were half implementing something that's going to take a couple of days of work and you didn't have it done, but you wanted to have continuous integration. So you're constantly pushing up code and pushing that out to your uh, user, uh, to your client base or your end users. What you could do is put a feature flag around that um, feature that's incomplete and be like, this is not complete. So it would be example flag, this would result to be false. This is not enabled yet because it's not completed. So we're gonna use you know whatever else existed or just don't use it at all. So it could be like an entire if statement around the entire function or entire, around the whole class or whatever it may be um, to block that from being used, but you would still wanna to continue to push out code that way we're increasing velocity. And a, and a use case for that could be a microservices environment. Let's say that you had a, um, like two tickets, one ticket um, for one microservice and another ticket for another microservice. And they both rely on each other, but one ticket could be used or one feature could be used already. It doesn't need the other dependency, but the other feature does need that other dependency. So we could have feature toggles and push both out, but then we don't, uh, we don't have to enable the feature that's not finished, but we don't have to block the other feature from going out. So that way we can continue integrating and pushing out code. Um, so let's go back a little bit. So yeah, like I said, the Boolean conditions control whether or not the features turn on or off. Um, this makes continuous integration possible. I, I don't do well at following my slides. Uh, then, like I was saying earlier, like you could do A-B testing and stuff like that. 
So let's say that you wanted to have a canary release or something where you wanted to have just a subset of users try out a new feature. You could set up in your configuration if the users are of this user ID, like maybe we have an array of user IDs and we're checking to see if any of the users logged into the application uh, have that user ID and exist within our like whitelisted group of like um, A users, then they could see that feature. And if they don't, then we're not gonna turn the feature on yet. And that could be a way of doing like a canary release or uh, something like that. Um, and yeah, this re reduces or like re removes the need to have multiple branches. We have branches because we have source control and we wanna have a CICD pipeline and the pipeline listens to changes within that branch to do deployments. So you still need a trunk branch, but we don't need extra branches because we're branching in code by more or less if statements. And a good tool that helps set this up is launch darkly. Um, this is like a little example, just to like show visually what it would look like. And I've already talked about it a bit, but uh, you have like an API key um, set up for node, the uh, launch darkly SDK. And then you can have like a feature flag that would, would exist inside of launch darkly. So you'd have this console that would show what exists and what doesn't. So this is gonna make an API call to see, hey, does this feature exist? It, if it does, um, then we'll enable the feature. If it doesn't, don't enable the feature. And then we can turn these on and off within here so we can have everything um, within a, a user interface that's like somewhat easy to use and manage all of our different configuration values there so we can turn on features on and off um, whenever they're, we're ready for them to be deployed. So then that way, like I said, again, we're not deploying based off of Git, we're deploying based off of code so that we're constantly pushing out code. That way we don't have long lived branches within environment-based branching or within GitFlow where we have to track JIRA tickets and we have to make sure like, hey, it has been deployed. What was this? This was like written a month ago. Where's the developer? Maybe they quit. Oh, we well, don't know what actually was written. Now we have like this whole list of changes that we want to get deployed out to the new release, but we don't know what all they do. So we have to scramble and find out what everything does. Then we have to put like a document together about what we just deployed and everything. That's how it was at my previous company. And it was a, a big pain um, and it worked, you know, it worked, we got deployments out and everything, but it was a struggle often to figure out what all was being deployed and whatnot. Whereas with this, you're constantly deploying and then you're managing it through if statements. And yeah, there's still some, uh, there's always like going to be a little bit of an issue with making sure that you're aware of what you're deploying, what you're turning on and turning off, but at least it's like not all within Jira tickets and within long lived branches that could be coming stale. Everything is constantly up to date and ready for deployment. That's the continuous delivery part. It's always ready to go into production, even if it's not turned on. So branching by extraction is just uh, another piece of um, trunk based development feature flags. It's like if you wanted to have a ticket that took maybe five days, like a bigger uh, thing to build, like the new authentication. Um, since we're building an entire new way of doing authentication, it may take longer than one or two days for us to complete. And so we can have uh, more feature flags around all of that new code changes and whatnot. So we'll have like larger subsets of changes uh, that are all wrapped around feature flags. Um, so yeah, perfect example again, just basically repeating myself. Uh, we put feature flags around the new auth, and once we're ready to turn that off, uh, we are ready to turn it on. We turn it on, we remove the abstractions, and we remove the old code, and while not breaking the build. Um, okay, so two ways to release to production. This goes back to the smaller teams or like uh, uh, the larger teams we're using feature branches or whatnot. If you're on a smaller team or if you just have like good checks, I guess it doesn't matter. It, it isn't dependent upon the team's size. Um, you could have within your CICD pipeline continuous de deployment, which is what this is talking about, this first bullet. Continuous deployment is after we go through our continuous integration checks in our pipeline, we're going to immediately deploy those code changes to production, to our end users. Now we could set up A-B testing or like um, uh, canary releases or whatever it may be. Um, so that we can still do some kind of checks before immediately pushing out code. Uh, or you could go with release branches and then maybe do acceptance tests on the release branches. And then if you did that, 
and side of um, your pipeline, that would end up being two pipelines, uh, which I think I have an example of. Yeah. So if you wanted to do a release branch, it would be two pipelines. Very, sim very, very similar to how GitFlow is set up. The biggest difference is that we're not releasing through Git, we're releasing through feature flags with release branches. It makes it kind of a hybrid, um, but we're still having our if statements and everything set up. But instead of having a uh, constant delivery or continuous delivery, we're going to be constant or sorry, continuous deployment. We're gonna have con continuous delivery, continuous integration, and then we'll cut a branch from trunk. And then that would be merged into a different branch probably called prod or whatever you wanted to call it. And then that would go into your production environment. So it's kind of similar to good flow in, in some ways like that. But uh, if you wanted to actually implement that into a pipeline, that's my way of doing it. I'm sure there's alternatives, but that's how I would do it. Otherwise it would be quite hard to have a different release branch every time and then somehow make that into a pipeline. You have to constantly update the pipeline. That doesn't seem like that would be something that would scale um so yeah that's the two different ways to release to production uh i think i've already talked about this um automatic releases the continuous de de deployment part and then bug fixes yeah like fixing forward so we're not going to do what we did in GitFlow, where we have a bug in prod and then we're going to make that branch off of prod or master branch and then merge it down into dev what we're going to do instead is make the bug fix on dev or on on trunk and if we're gonna have a release branch, or whatever, we're gonna cherry pick that commit individually and push that up into our um, production release uh, branch. And then uh, a good example of like why you would wanna do that or you're fixing forward. Uh, oh, sorry, I think I actually misspoke a little bit, but to continue on my train of thought, um, a reason why you would wanna do a bug fix, not from top down, instead do bottom up, is recently at the company I'm working at, there was a bug fix that happened in one of our environments and they went from top down from the QA environment, there was a bug and they merged it down into dev. We didn't have automated checks set up or somebody's gonna run a linter. And so whenever they merged it down into dev, it broke dev because there was a bug or a lint failure that was introduced into the QA branch, our fault for not having checks there as well, we do now. Um, and then when it merged it down, it broke the develop branch, which does have all the checks. And so I was making a code change and I pushed up code and then it broke my build and I didn't know why or what was going on. And then I saw that there was a previous commit from QA down to dev instead of going from dev cherry picking up. So that way we can make sure that we're following the process of every environment that stays the same. And then, you know, there causes like issues, less issues with regression of reintroducing the same bug. Um, Okay, yeah, I think I pretty much covered this with the different releases. Here's a diagram. So we're just gonna go straight off of trunk into our release or this is our release branch, sorry. And if we wanted to release, then we'll make a release branch, tag it, have a version, and then deploy that. Um, it showed the pipeline. So this is kind of what I'm talking about with the cherry picks. Like I said, I, I got ahead of myself. Uh, so, yeah, if we're gonna have a bug, we're gonna fix the bug in dev, grab that um, commit hash, cherry pick that individually, bring it up to the release branch and then release that environment instead of um, going from release branch down, like how it that happens in GitFlow. Okay. So then here's another example of if you wanted to have it all within one pipeline and just had automated releases or continuous deployment, then we would just have one pipeline and three environments within that. So back to the DevOps culture, DevOps mindset and like autonomy and um, everything else that we're talking about. You can have all of those things across every branching strategy, but it helps if we're gonna have a real CI CD pipeline. And I think that you know, I initially made this slide and wanted to just put CI, CD, continuous integration, continuous de delivery. That's why you want to do trunk um, because it really helps enforce and enable you to have those kind of um, features within your pipeline. That way you're constantly producing code and putting it, pushing in code every single day, finished or not, we're putting checks around it um, with our if statements, our feature flags, and 
That way we're constantly ready for deployment at any time. That's more or less why you want to use trunk. Okay, any questions on, on any of that stuff? Feel free to, to say it now or you never get another chance. Hey, Austin, do we have uh, access to your slides, your slide decks? Uh, no, I'll share that with you guys now. All right, thanks. All right, I just put it in the chat. Okay, if nobody's got any other questions, um, I've got this repo set up that is uh, a pretty basic API. Um, it's just uh, all node and has a, a REST endpoint and a GraphQL endpoint to return. Really not very helpful um, pricing on uh, lambdas and EC2 instances. It was just something to put together, not very creative. So put that together, but the point of this is there's the different pipelines. I'm not gonna go over CDK or anything like that, but all this is written within the CDK. And so I have different um, environment or different branching strategies here that exist. Uh, so you guys can go and look at this if you're interested. Um, otherwise I'm gonna to go to the console and go over that, but essentially it's just a Lambda function and it deploys a Lambda in three different ways. Um, and yeah, uh, I forgot to ask a question earlier, but this is still all within uh, um, AWS uh, organizations. So I'll actually show you that first, just so we can get an idea of what the um, setup here is. So this is the top level account. This is also the account where I have the, uh, what's it called, um, the pipeline. So we have a, a dev stage and prod, and I have like some duplicates here. This is from me following a, a course and trying to get a certification. Um, but yeah, we have the top level account and then we have the child accounts. And so if we look at our um, CICD pipeline, no, that stupid Zoom thing popped up. Okay. So if we look at the pipelines that we have here. Um, what these do, for the application is they run the CDK, build the CDK builds an artifact that is a, a CloudFormation template. And then these pipelines have access to deploy the CloudFormation template in its appropriate environment. So if you looked at the environment-based pipeline, uh, gets the source from code commit, uh, does the application build. What happens in the application build is He's loaded. Basically just runs tests and builds the application. Uh, I don't think there's much else going on in there. Let me take a second to load. But yeah, this happens within code builds. So code builds the tool that Amazon has for actually building our application, running our tests, running our linter. And if those any of those fail, the pipeline fails. So here's an extra check. So like inside of GitHub, and I didn't pay for the version that actually does these checks in GitHub. Um, and some of my stuff is failing, but GitHub has GitHub Actions. Uh, all of mine are failing. Um, uh, and so these GitHub Actions would run, I have it defined to run my actual tests. So in here it runs my uh, lint, my tests. So if any of those fail, then on the paid version, it would block me from merging a pull request. I have Husky set up. So that this way, whenever I make a commit, it runs my test and my linter. And then on the pipeline, we're, we're doing it again. We're doing it in multiple places to make sure that we're having uh, as much code coverage as possible or as much test coverage as possible within our pipeline. Jesus thing is not loading. It's just basically logs to show the different um, steps anyway. So it's not super crazy. Um, but it deploys the, or it takes the artifact, puts that in S3. This one takes the artifact, puts it in S3, and that way we have a bundle of our Lambda function and we have a CloudFormation template that's ready to be deployed. Ignore all my S3 buckets that are not used. Um, I forgot what the name of it was.
I don't remember what the name of the, of the thing was. Uh, it's not super important. All it is is sh just showing that the files exist. That's all I was going to do. What's this? Yeah, like these zips. And then within the zip, potentially that's where it's at. Honestly, I don't remember. Basically, like I said, artifacts of the actual code and the confirmation template. Confirmation template being, if you not aware the set of rules to deploy my environment, which is API Gateway, DynamoDB, and Lambda. And then that gets deployed. So what happens here is, what does this say for details? Um, cool, so this shows us CloudFormation, or yeah, and this goes to the dev account. So here's the different account, um, and it assumes the role and a place that account. So if I wanted to go to that account, just to show what it looked like, and then we'll go to the other pipelines. Um, so then here's confirmation, and we were looking at the environment-based. It's the same application, just three times. Um, so then here you can see the different resources. We have DynamoDB, Lambda functions, some permissions, API gateway, some IAM roles, whatever else needs to happen with that. And this all comes from this parent account. So if you went back and looked at the architecture, uh, these environment-based deployments, it's the parent account and then the dev account, parent account and then the stage account, parent account and the product account. So that we were isolating everything. So we'll go back to the main account. And then good flow. We have two different environments here, two different pipelines here. Like you can see for the environment base, this is per branch. So within here I have a develop stage and main branch, uh, main being production, develop being develop, stage being stage. Those correlate back to this environment based branching. And then for good flow, we have develop which correlates to, I think, just develop branch or to envelop environment, develop branch, develop environment. Same exact pipeline as the other one. The prod one goes um, stage, and then this is the manual approval I was talking about. So if you successfully deployed to stage, let's say you did your testing, uh, then you could, and all the testing could all be automated as well, it could be automated within uh, code build, or you could have a Lambda or some kind of hook um, something could run and test all that. Then we could review this and say, add additional comment or just approve it. Then we approve that and that'll deploy to prod if it passes. So then now you can see this is in progress. It was in progress before, but um, now it's actually deploying to the prod environment. And then for trunk, everything's all together. So I set up gates everywhere um, between dev to stage and then stage to prod. You don't have to do that. And I might in the future have removed this, it just depends on like how the team wants to work and your agreement that you'd have with each other. But uh, this way I could go back here and say, hey, the last poorly awarded uh, commit um, passed in dev. Uh, let's go ahead and move that up to stage. And then you can do your gates within the pipeline. Um, and maybe this isn't a great way to do this with trunk, but uh, let's just assume that we didn't have this check. We went straight to um, prod and we we're just immediately going dev stage prod and our checks were gated by um, if statements instead feature toggles. So that's the that's the gist of it for the different branching strategies as I understand them at least. Um, yeah, let's see. So, so yeah, launch darkly, pretty good tool, I think, for setting up like feature flags and whatnot. Is that open source? Uh, I think. Or is it SaaS? I think yeah, I think it's SaaS. I think they have a paywall. There might be some stuff that's open for you to use. Um, I'm not sure. Cool. I, I Google it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but then, then, like I said, you could set up like, you know, uh, a bunch of different values in here or say like you wanted to have the, the user IDs and have like just a specific subset of users that got to see the new environment or whatever. Yeah, all of this could be configured within launch darkly. And then like showed with the dashboard earlier, the different flags turning them on and off and everything happens through an API call. 
you guys have any questions, anything that isn't super clear? <laughs> I think hey, that's I'll, Yeah. Very quick question. Um, you know, a lot of the talk was kind of set on the backdrop of Git as the source control. Do you see any reason why, you know, the, these kind of practices couldn't be used with other types of source control? Uh, no, I mean, it would all be the, like, what? yeah, I guess that would all be the same. Like, are you talking about if you use like SVN or anything like that? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because I think I've seen environment-based branching out of uh, like Team Foundation server, like Microsoft source control. So yeah. it's like, I always see like, uh, these kind of talks like based on Git because Git's pretty much awesome. Um, but it's like, you know, these are just principles that could be applied to other source control. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think it's just the, the, the difference isn't so much Git. It's, I guess I use Git as an example, but rather you're using another tool to uh, change how you're doing deployments versus doing it within code itself. Yeah, for sure. Also, it, it kind of like paints you into a box when something's called Git flow. So I don't think you're being too narrow minded. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know if you guys are open to making 50 bucks. Um, does anybody want to put an answer in the chat or blurt it out why it's called Git flow or why you think it's called Git flow? I don't know why it's called Git flow, but I have, a, I have a, what I think it's why, why it's called 50 bucks on the line of AWS credits, that's not redeemable to actual 50 bucks. So if you don't use AWS, <laughs> they're not worth much. <laughs> if not, we'll do a random number and somebody will get money anyway, because I got I have to give it out. You guys want a hint? Well, I think Brandon's pretty much hit the nail on the head there. Yeah, I think that's the best answer that's going to come. <laughs> well played. Nice. Does Brandon win 50 uh, AWS credits? Yeah, just by the flow. I do. Know. That'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why it's called Git Flow either. Short uh, for Git Workflow? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, I think it's called Git Flow, in my opinion, because of this, uh, you're using Git to elevate different environments. So it's the flow of Git using Git as the tool to deploy to different environments. Git flow, I don't know. That's my, that's my, that was my the reason why I thought it was called that. But the guy who wrote it actually like updated his post, uh, his blog post, I forgot the guy's name, but I think he wrote it like 10 years ago or something like that. And he was saying like Git flow, the best way to like deploy or whatever. And it was like recently updated to be like, Maybe don't use Git flow <laughs> well, by himself. I feel like the guy who writes, uh, who made up the idea of Git flow says, maybe go with trunk. That's a good sign for trunk. But um, he was like, if you have like specific team needs or different sizes or whatever, like Git flow might not be a good thing. Like if you're trying to constantly deploy stuff and not have to deploy every like three months or whatever. But uh, yeah, Brandon, I'll give you that. I'll give you 50 bucks for uh, the good answer. Thanks, I appreciate that. First time here, by the way. Right on. Thanks for joining. Thank you. First, hopefully not last. Uh, I'll send it to you in the chat. And then, yeah, if you guys have any questions, like feel free. Otherwise, I'm gonna just pick a random person and give away another 50 bucks. I gotta find where they're at. I created a spreadsheet with the names of the participants and then generated a, a random number, which came out to 12, which is Joel Roberts. Nice. Looks like Joel has uh, left the building. Oh. Let's do it again. Yep. Okay. Josh Blair. Oh, that works because Josh also provided what seems like it could be the real answer to the naming of Git flow. So yeah. Congrats, Josh. Sweet. I guess Austin will hit you up in the uh in the chat. Yep. Thanks, guys. For sure. Thanks for joining. 
Sweet. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, if there's any more questions, I think the biggest takeaway is like understanding DevOps culture because that's like so big in the organization. Like if you're really trying to write good software and have your team like really maintain and like take control of the software that's being written across the board, that's like one of the best things I've, I've learned or had uh, been able to experience is like working on a team that actually like really cares about this and like trusting you as a developer to do what you can do and giving you a little bit of a leash treating you like a person things like that it seems like all these things are like human problems that we're trying to fix with technology without recognizing that they're human problems and i think to recognize that they're human problems helps it at least for me it makes it a lot easier to fix because then you're like oh i can understand what's actually going on here like why we're doing this um yeah if you guys don't know anything else there's a talk reoccurring guest um last meetup we had uh andrew from uh Contino come out and do a talk and he'll be back i think for march um what's his talk gonna be it's gonna be about um native cloud development techniques does that sound right yeah that sounds about right uh cloud native development techniques yeah yep and i'll put the link for his like previous talk or like of that and the channel in the chat if you guys want to see it let me check it but yeah he'll be here in march 23rd i think is what we have right now no nothing official but that's like the rough date we're pretty bad at sticking to dates or at least i am <laughs> anything else kevin no nothing for me good talk Sweet. Yeah, first one in months. A little rusty. You did great. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll close it out then. Dang, we got it right at an hour. That's pretty good. Yeah, nice. No, not the two-hour talks anymore. Oh, those are different. We were in person. It's like a different age. <laughs> yeah. First 15, 20 minutes were like pizza. Hey, we got food. Yeah. Everybody's like, I'm only here for the food. I was only there for the food. Yeah, basically. How did I get food. broken in virtual ones? Food and beer, yeah. Yeah, that was nice. We didn't have to pay for it at the time, too. That was really nice. How did that happen? <laughs> Galvanize. They're quite Someone's nice. Somebody's like, yeah, that's a good idea. We'll give them free food and, and beer. Like, all right. I don't know what benefit we're providing you, but we'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> all right um yeah we're gonna close it out then i don't know see you guys march hopefully everybody's safe and at home and warm if you're in denver it's snowing so talk to you later thank you hey.